Amen. Thank Gary. I appreciate it. And uh, I did pray and I still pray every morning, every Sunday morning that uh, God will speak to us and God will change our hearts and bring us closer to him and make us fruitful. That's my greatest prayer for us as a church. But anyway, uh, last Sunday of the month, is it? Must be. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, blank. Senior moment for a second. I'm 52, but yeah. Um, with this month, we'll actually uh, finish our Loving Others series, which began actually back in February. And we took several aspects of what does it mean to love others. And this month was focused on especially loving others enough to give them the gospel, which is basically about evangelism. We uh, said two weeks ago uh, that evangelism means basically teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade or convince or lead to faith. Faith. Although it's not our job to, to save someone, our job is to teach the gospel, having this intention in our hearts that we can see that person receiving Christ and becoming a Christian and receiving everlasting life most than, more than everything else. And we heard uh, Neil in his uh, sermon, it's not a sermon, uh, video, that he spoke about him doing evangelism and being a missionary. Well, this is what we do. It's not just Neil or people like Neil that do this. It's something that's part of the life of the church and of every Christian. Not, not every Christian, Christian goes to Greece or to you know, Papua New Guinea or Africa or wherever, but we are all called to fulfill this ministry of evangelism. And that's what we've talked last uh, two weeks ago and last week with Pastor Fletcher, again about God's passion for the lost and for the big har great harvests out there and for the call for more and more workers in the harvest. And uh, we, we said last uh, two weeks ago, actually, that there are three big questions that uh, we need to ask ourselves. Are we motivated? Are we equipped? And are we available? And we'll go back to these questions a bit today. But like I said, um, since we began this series, today is about tears and fears. Or if you actually, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to go fears and tears. I'm going to speak about the fears that we have when we hear the word evangelism and also about the tears of God for the lost, his heart crying for those who are lost. So let's start. Um, as we have uh, heard the word of God from, uh, from uh, Jane this morning, these commandments are present in the scriptures, not just once, but many times. You know, the Acts 1.8, you know, Paul, Jesus says to the disciples that they will receive a power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they will be witnesses. And it says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the idea is that the disciples were to be witnesses, you know, to testify about Christ. And then this, there was, that was not something new. All the way back in the beginning of the gospel, in Mark 1, we heard the words, Come unto me, and I will make you fishers of men. Interesting, because we're talking to fishers, uh, that are people that were fishing, and it tells them that now they'll be fishers of men, a different kind of ministry. And obviously, the beauty of Proverbs 11.30 that says, The fruit of the righteousness is a, is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. He who wins souls is wise. Now, if we have all these commandments, all these encouragements, all these verses of the scriptures, especially this beautiful Proverbs 11.30, he who wins soul, he or she who wins souls is wise. Why don't we do more of it? What stops us? Well, obviously, it's fears. I was reading an article from uh, Campus Crusade for Christ uh, from a... Um, a poll done about four or five years ago, actually 2016. And number one thing that stops people from sharing their, their faith is fear, different kinds of fears, you know, not just one kind of fear, but there are several types that makes people avoid evangelism. So let's take them one by one, you know, not just fears, but other, other roadblocks in the way of evangelism and analyze them. What are our fears and, and, and what stops? And then we'll move on to what do we do now? What's the practical advice for us today? So, like I said, fear is the strongest deterrent against evangelism, you know, and most likely is this phrase, we are afraid of what people might think of us. That's the most common phrase as an excuse. I am afraid of what people might think of me. But an author I read this week from a book of his said, being afraid of what people think and therefore not doing what is right he said, 
It's almost a form of idolatry. Clearly reminds us of John 12, 42 and 43. And you probably know for me, that's one of the most, one of the saddest actually, verses of the, of the, of the Gospel of John. That says this. So John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for the fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put, put out of the synagogue. And verse 43, for they loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God. They loved the glory from man more than the glory from God. And to me, that's one of the saddest verses of the scripture. Now, if we put there, not loving the glory, but fearing their words, it's the same thing. Sometimes we fear man more than we fear God. And obviously, like I said before, that almost sounds like, like idolatry. So, fear of what people might think. That's probably the most uh, uh, prevalent, the most common one. But how about fear of rejection? We know that most people would not accept the gospel. Many would reject it because... Uh, personal reasons, don't believe in God, or they just like sin, they love the way they live now, and they, they just don't care. And therefore, the fact that they reject the gospel feels almost like that we are the ones being rejected, although God is the one actually they reject, not us. Reminds me of 1 Samuel 8, when Samuel felt rejected when he thought, or you know, he might be the next leader of Israel, when people asked for a king, God spoke to Samuel and said, it is not you they reject, but me. Same with us. We know God is the one they actually reject, but we feel that rejection and we fear it because we don't like it. We don't like to be rejected. Or we don't, so we are afraid of looking foolish. We know people nowadays, nowadays they, they look down upon those who have faith in Christ. It's, it's the common theme of the word around, world around us. And we're afraid to say, I'm a Christian, I believe in God. In schools or in colleges, universities, where people who believe science is actually against God, which is not, but that's what they believe, they would come hard against us saying, oh, you're foolish. How do you believe that? Well, we might have some other counter, counter questions for them. How do you believe that? That's even more fool. Anyway, I'm not going there today. But... We are afraid to look foolish, and therefore we kind of hide who we are as Christians, and we don't really go forth with the message of the gospel. Because we might fear that uh, we will be labeled as, as religious nuts, and therefore avoid it. And we don't like that, you know, because one of the greatest fears we have today is that uh, social awkwardness. We want to have, be socially accepted and be, you know, blend in and be with the people. And when it's this social awkwardness, because we brought up Christ, we don't like it. And because we don't like it, we don't do it. It's pretty simple. People do what they feel like doing, and we don't feel like doing that. So those are some of the fears that we spoke, uh, when we speak about when it comes to evangelism. Fear of being, uh, fear of what people think, people, uh, fe fear of rejection, fear of being labeled as foolish or just a religious nut. With this fear actually comes something else. A second reason that for which that stops from evangelizing, and that is discouragement. Common, common emotion for many of us. Discouragement. We tried many times. We failed many times. People, we felt rejected many times, and we kind of like don't have any 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 drive to continue. You know, we we kind of lose heart. That's actually the biblical word. We lose heart, and we stop doing it because we 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 get we become discouraged. Repeated failures or even lack of visible results. When we preach the gospel, gospel for years and years and years and nothing happens, you get discouraged. I had a blessing to, to speak with a good friend of mine. His name is Paul, Paul, we say in Romanian. And he's Romanian, he's now living in China for, I don't know, 15 years, I think now. And uh, he um, called me one day and he said, Adi, I'm almost ready to give up. I said, oh, come on, why? That's your life's dream to be in China and evangelize, you know, Tibetans and stuff. And he said, I've been working with this group of like five or six or seven people for years and years and years, and I don't see a change in them. And I had to sit down you know, over the phone, obviously, and, and, and encourage him to persevere because 
results are not immediate and we're not called to do to, to bring up bring about results we're called to be faithful so but discouragement because of rejection or because of lack of visible results is something we need to pray for or not pray pray for pray against that anyway so fear discouragement another thing that stops us is kind of funny but let me let me say this the attempt to blend in we want to say oh i want to be there become friends with them i want to be you know where they are so i can just you know have an open door to preach the gospel but we blend in so well that no one knows we're christians and then when we bring it up it's kind of like really awkward you know so our attempt to blend in that goes too far it's again becomes an obstacle in itself so people should know that you're a christian sooner rather than later you know i made a habit that whenever i join a different uh, social group social place whatever it's a it's a, a photography club or i don't know somewhere i try to in that, like the first meeting the first time together to make sure that people know that i'm a christian and it's not because i want them to know i'm a christian i want me to live with this knowledge that they know that i'm a christian it's mostly most mostly for my sake that i don't become complacent in this blend in attempt you know so fear discouragement the blending going too far another issue that stops from evangelism is this and it's very common for for people like me for example it's isolation or insulation i'm not sure if it's, which is the best word is basically it's living in a christian bubble we go to a christian church obviously christian church we go to a christian school we have christian friends we have a christian club afterwards we do social uh we do golf with christian people whatever i don't know we realize suddenly that there is like no one around us who's not a Christian. So what do we do? You know, well, I don't know. I, I guess we'll just golf on or eat on or whatever it is that you do. Well, not really, because if you realize you have no Christian friends and no Christians, your Christians, your social, you know, area that you, you go every day or every week, do something about it. As a Christian, as a, sorry, as a pastor, I know that my ministry, my, my work is mostly or almost entirely with Christians. Very rarely I deal with non-Christians. And what do I do? In Canada, right here, I joined a photography club, Scarborough Camera Club. I'm part of, I'm a member of this club for like a few months now. And now actually, actually as of next September, I'm going to be part of the executive board. So I'm going to have not just one meeting a week, but two meetings a week, extra. I'm not complaining. I love photography, but, and I love, I love that, you know, people, I don't know, I, I just, I kind of surfaced up and I'm again part of leadership of that group even that I didn't seek that but I'm glad I'm there with pretty much just non-Christians because I get a chance to be that guy the pastor the Christian guy the weird guy the guy with the Bible I don't care because you know what I think I, I think I've made a good impression without even hiding for a second that I'm a Christian I'm, I'm passionate about Christ and the Bible is is my joy and my treasure you know so don't hide that you're a Christian. If you feel, if you realize you're isolated or insulated, just break the walls and find something to do with non-Christians. Okay, a couple of more of the uh, things that stop us. Busyness. Sometimes we find ourselves that we're so busy with stuff that we cannot even stop for a second and spend half an hour talking with a non-Christian friend or neighbor or stranger. The busyness of life is actually a problem because as my first, uh, one of my first pastors uh, used to say, when the devil cannot stop us, he's pushing us forth. So we kind of like tumble again, tumble around uh, doing too many things and not, be, not being able to focus on what matters most. So business, if you think you're too busy to share the gospel, think again. Think again about your priorities and think what needs to change so you can actually be that wise person who wins souls, as Solomon wrote. Okay, because it is your your call to be a fisher of men, to be a, a, a witness for Christ. You, even if you don't have the gift of evangelism, you're called to preach or to share the gospel, share the good news, share a testimony with others. So business, don't go there. If you're there, pray for different priorities and rearrange your priorities according to God's priorities. Another one is people won't listen. That's connected with the lack of fruit. But basically when we say this, we have this misconception that puts too much accent or emphasis on what we do and what's our part. And we forget about the role of the Holy Spirit. 
that we are just to be faithful in what we have we need to say and do and then god's god will do the rest god through holy spirit will do the rest you know i'm I, i've learned recently this week actually that jonathan edwards a great evangelist and missionary not evangelist actually just from uh seven, 18th century he wrote an account once of the great awakening awakening in the states and he titled it this a narrative of surprising conversions and I love that. I love, I want to pray for surprising conversions. I want you guys to pray for surprising conversions. When people have no, you think they will never, ever, never, ever receive the gospel. But actually, when one day knock at the door and say, hey, I want to pray. I want you to pray for me. Remember this uh, story from my, back in my Calvary Chapel days. Uh, one of the uh, now pastors of a, a pretty big church in the States, in California, wrote his account about his uh, uh, transformation. You know, he was a bike uh, gang member, you know, and he was put on the blacklist. He was supposed to be killed for some trespass he did against the gang. So because of that, he lived in like ditches and stuff for weeks upon weeks. And his beard was was big and he was smelly and he was dirty and he was, you know, everything was bad looking. And he was realized about, he remembered about this commune house, young men living together in this house somewhere that might give him shelter and might give him a way out. So he walks into this uh, uh, Christian commune house for young men and he go, goes to the guy who was like at a reception or something. And imagine this. So you're a 20-some young kid from, from seminary, you know, Bible trained, you know, grew up in your Bible bubble and stuff. And suddenly you see this big guy, six foot three or six foot five, dressed in leather, dirty and sm uh, smelling bad with a beard that was like rough and gruff. And then with a Beretta in his belt. Beretta is a, a nine millimeter uh, pistol. And the guy says, I want you to pray for me. And the guy obliged, you know, more fear than anything else. And he did pray for that guy. And that man is, that man is now a pastor of a great church in the U.S. So pray for surprising conversions because God can and will surprise us. Don't say people won't listen. They may not. But you don't know when they will actually. And the Spirit of God will change a heart. So be faithful. And I think I have one more, a couple of more. Okay, apathy. This actually was touched by Pastor Fletcher last week. When we don't care that much anymore, we forget about the compassion that Christ had in Matthew 9, 36. We, he looked down upon the people and said, and he had compassion for them. And sometimes we lose that compassion. and The result is apathy. We just don't care. And if you think you're there, we, some of us might be there. Sometimes our own pain, our own suffering, our own problems, actually lead us to apathy again uh, apathy when concerning the, the, the lost if you're there pray for god's heart when it comes to the lost and just snap out of that apathy you may not do it yourself it's go and pray with someone pray with me i'll pray with you because sometimes i deal with the same problem i i, I focus my, uh, myself on so many other things that i just forget about the lost and i need to pray with people that I can be reminded of God's compassion and passion for the lost. The last one on the list of things that stop us. Let me remind you which word there um, and uh, just go through my list. Fear. Fear of what people might think of us. Fear of rejection. Fear of looking foolish. Fear of being labeled as a religious nut or extre extremist. And then after that could be discouragement because of failures, it's because of lack of uh, visible results, the attempt of blending in that goes way too far, the uh, insulation. Oh, when I jump, I, I jumped over one. Insulation meant, meant we're just with Christians and we have no non-Christians around us. I jumped over the lack of training. When you say, well, I don't know what to say. Really? Well, okay, if you don't know what to say, lift up your hand, not, not now, because I won't be able to see. I just see my, my camera right now. But uh, text me, email me, you know, send a, you know, a flying dove or something, I don't know. And I can walk with you through the basic of the gospel that I can share with anyone. And you can memorize and take with you wherever you want. If not, if, you, if your memory is like, like mine, pretty much gone, I can give you a brochure called the Four Spiritual, Four Spiritual Laws, I think it's called, by Bill Bright. And it's simple. God loves you. Sin brought a separation between you and God. 
Christ bridged that gap. And now your job is, your, your next step is to accept Christ. And then he says, actually, enjoy the church. Anyway, so lots of tools, lots of books. Well, actually, we'll go back to this uh, in, a, in a moment. Busyness, when you're too busy to actually stop for a second and share the gospel with someone. The assumption that people have to listen to you, and if they don't listen, then nothing happens, and you forget that God can surprise us. And then apathy, when you just don't care anymore because you're too busy with your own problems and stuff. And last and probably not least is bad theology. You know, recently in the last uh, 20, 30 years, there's been this movement around churches that kind of tries to remove the sting out of hell, you know, whether it's by universalism, saying that God will save everybody. In the end. God loves people so much. God loves us so much that in the end, he'll just look over our sin and just save us all. That's called universalism. So when we say that, when you think like that, basically all the, em all the uh, empathies, all the drive towards evangelism just dissipates. Or you go the other way around and we say, well, the loss will be just uh, obliterated. They'll just stop existing. You know, there won't be, there will be no suffering. They'll just stop being. So meh, maybe it's not that bad, you might say. So people stop doing actually events because of that. Or when you take election and God's sovereignty too far, then you say, well, he'll do it his way. He's got his elect. He's got the ones who are not elect, I guess the opposite of elect. And then I don't need to bother because God will do it his way and he'll save those he wants to be saved. So I, I don't need to invest much effort in that. So that was the last one. What do we do now? How do we move from this fears and discouragement and bad theology and whatever towards what are we, what we are to do uh, with our lives as messengers of the gospel, as ambassadors of the gospel? How do we move from focusing on fears and in inadequacies to God's power and God's wisdom. Well, first step, if you have your Bible with you, please open with me at Luke chapter 15. As you can see today is that we have no, um, no PowerPoint for the sermon because I kind of want sometimes to kind of like push you to open up your actual Bibles and not just rely upon me putting verse on the screen because you got to be able to use this thing. You know, it's called a Bible. It's a book. So Sorry, I don't want to be condescending or anything, but uh, you can use an app. You know, I have friends who actually use only apps, but use the scriptures. Be familiar with the scriptures. Don't just rely upon a PowerPoint on Sunday morning for the only source of the scriptures. This is your Bible. So what do we see in, in the, in the, just if you look over uh, chapter 15 of Luke, what do you see there? If you don't know much, you can just read the, uh, the, the superscript and it got three parables. One is about a lost sheep. One is about a lost coin. And the last one about a prodigal or oh, lost son. And all, all these uh, three parables, with the one with the lost sheep, basically is that the good shepherd leaves the 99 to go and rescue the one that's lost. And that puts so much value on the lost one, even though 91, 99 are still found and there, but the shepherd cares about the one that's lost with his whole heart and passion. And the one with the coin is about a woman who just, uh, because he cannot throw, she cannot locate one silver coin, she brings a lamp and sweeps the whole house and seeks diligently until he, she finds that one lost coin. And when she finds it, she calls her friends together, her neighbors, and saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. Now, in a cash, almost a cash-free society, we might not think about this much. But think about your childhood when you had just coins, if you had any. And if you lost one, that was a tragedy. And we just look over the place just to find that one coin that was lost. Remember one day I was in the military and I was patrolling uh, my uh, post, which was based to guard about five acres of, of corn of our unit. Not much of a job, but yeah, whatever. So walking by the street, me and my dog and uh, another soldier, I look down and I see a hundred, a bill, a hundred, like a hundred dollar bill, which is a lot. I mean, it's huge. My pay a month was 64 lei. And I found a bill that was a hundred lei. And because I found one, I thought, hmm. So I keep looking around, I found a second one. I was so, so rejoicing, but I thought if there are two, maybe it's more. So I walk around, I find a third one. I found 300 lei on the, on, the, on the ground in the grass. 
that was like in the morning. Guess what I did the whole day, the next like 12 hours. I walked around every single inch of that five acres. Trying, I didn't find anything more. That was it. 300 lay. No idea who lost them. And uh, it was nice, nice bills or whatever. I don't know. But I was so committed for like the next 12 hours. All I was like looking down and searching for those bills. You know why? Because we care. And this parable is not about money. It's not the finance parable, although people might use it for that. It's about the one that is lost. This phrase, the one that was lost, was the sheep or the coin, and, or you've seen in the parable of the prodigal son, which many people preached uh, out of, probably I have, I'm not sure I have at this church, uh, Bridal Town Park yet, but it's that son who wants his share of the inheritance, takes it and go, the father gives the son the share, and then the son goes and just spends everything on, on foolish things. And then when he comes to his senses, he comes back to his father with these words. Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I guess I can say I can sin against heavens and against you. And the father rejoices and brings his son back into his family. He he kisses the son and embraces him and gives him a, a great like a bear hug. Because his son was lost and now is found. The same like the, the sheep and the coin. All these parables come together, one chapter. And the point is this: Luke wants us to know, God wants us to know how much God cares for the lost. And the question for us is, how much do we care for the lost? Look around. I mean, you can not right now, but think about the, the church area where Broughton Park is. Think about those high races. We have uh, the one on Finch. We have uh, one on Echo. We have uh, Dennis's building or Pat's building, whatever you want to call it. And how many people leave in the, live in those buildings? How many of them are saved? Do we care with the same heart as God? Please just flip a few pages to Luke 19. Just read one verse from Luke 19, uh, and that would be verse 41 that says this. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Jesus wept over the city because he knew. He knew the, you know, who, it says here, who that would... Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when you will, your enemies will set up barricades around you and surround you and hem you in oversight and tear you down to the ground, and so on and so forth. He looked upon the city and he cried. He wept. My prayer for us all is to have the same heart as Jesus, to care for the lost, just like in that parable, was a coin, a sheep, or a son? It doesn't matter. It says God cares for the lost. He cares that much. When he looks down, he, he weeps over those who are lost. He weeps over cities, over Toronto, Scarborough, Markham, name it, whatever you want. And sometimes we don't. We're so busy with what we have. We're so happy with what we have sometimes. And we just don't care that much. It's pretty much like we know there's a fire going on under a building, under a house. And we found the exit. We know that that door is the exit. The way to life is through that door. And we walk calmly, not telling anyone else that they're burning alive and that's the door over there. We just walk outside, make sure we're safe, and we do nothing about it. That's only, it's the exact opposite of God's heart. God's heart is go and snatch as many as you can ask from the fire because they're worth it. God cares for the lost. We must, we are, we ought, I don't know what the words, words to use, but I pray that we have the same heart to love the others enough to give them the gospel, to bring them the gospel in such a way that some of them might be saved. I know that we don't direct the fruit. We don't bring in, we don't call for, I mean, sorry, we're not the ones that ordain the fruit. God is. He saves people. He brings people in. But we must be faithful with a heart for the loss that God has. So what do we do? Now it's a list. Ooh, sorry. Not really, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'll go fast. And if you need, I can actually email you this list uh, uh, that you might just use it for your own uh, personal study. But anyway, if you think your heart is where it, not sh where it should not be, First step is repent. Repent 
of that attitude of selfishness and egotism when you think that you matter you matter most and you just forget about the lost and just don't care about the lost repent and ask God to change your heart because repentance means you understand the problem and you turn away in a chain you're, you're being changed by God repent and ask rely upon God's grace and love to change you don't fear that oh you've gone too far you've said too few things to too few people it's too late no God has grace and he will change your heart if you do if you do repent before him because if you think your heart is too cold or whatever just go before God and say Lord I'm sorry and I need you and I trust your grace that you will give me that heart and then pray pray against your own fears pray against your own inadequacies or or limitations and then pray for open hearts and divine appointments. So pray against your fear, your own fears, and pray for God to open doors and bring people to you or bring you to people that are open, prepared by God to receive the gospel. And pray that every day. I think I said this two weeks ago. You may not talk to others every day, but you should expect every day that you might speak to someone about Christ. But that, that should be part of your prayers every morning. Lord, Bring me someone today I can share the gospel with. Plan. If you repent and you pray, but you don't plan, like if you don't do nothing, just stick in your basement and you just don't go out from there, nothing will happen much. If you don't plan to be out there and do something against the busyness or the isolation, whatever the problem is, you must plan and move in a, such a way that you break the walls that keep you from not sharing the gospel. Plan about it, you know. It's like just okay. I've been. I have done nothing the whole month. I want to go out today. I want to walk down the boardwalk at Woodbine Bridge and pray for someone to be open to share to to talk to me, and then I will share the gospel with that one person. You know, make some plan. I, I just was a made that plan right now, but do something and have confidence in the gospel. Have confidence in God's gospel. Pray. Say with say with with Paul together, as in Romans one. Those amazing, amazing words from Romans 1. Let me open up 1, 18 or 19. What is it? 16, sorry. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is God's power for salvation to anyone who believes, first to the Jew and then also to the Greek. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To not be, so have confidence in God's gospel. Accept that it is your duty. Not Adi's, not the elders, not the G Neil McCrisis or Fiona's or whatever. It is your own duty to share the gospel. Even if you don't have the gift of evangelism, you should still pray for your own part in, evangelistic, in, in, in evangelism. And be faithful. Be faithful in sharing what must be shared with others. Sometimes we are unfaithful because we care more about the feelings of someone than about the actual truth of God. So be faithful in sharing the gospel and persevere. For some people, it may take moments. A month, a week, a day, an hour, I don't know. But for others, it may take years. How many years... I wish Dennis would be here to, to answer this question. How many years did Dennis's mom prayed for her son, for Dennis? It was only after she passed away that Dennis actually became a Christian. So persevere. Don't give up. You're not called to command the fruit and say, I want, I want to bring this much fruit. That's up to God. Your call is to be faithful in preaching the gospel, in sharing and connecting with people that are not Christians and giving them the gospel. Take risks. Take risks. The risk of being rejected. The risk of being labeled or laughed at. Take risks. I mean, for some, like Neil, is to take a risk of being, you know, having his car uh, tires slashed or being, you know, attacked with a, with a club by an angry gypsy in the colony. That's very physical risk that Neil takes up in Greece. And probably others take even more risks if you talk about China or Vietnam or other places. But for us, the risk is actually just a social awkwardness. So just take that risk. It's not that risky in Canada yet. So just, just go forth. You know, share a book. Share a meal. 
start a conversation or like Bill Hybels, how much as, as much as he is like not really, you know, in the limelight right now, he wrote this book called Walk Across the Room and the power to just look around the who's like the lonely person, who's that person who's like no one talks to him or her and just walk across the room and say hi and share God's love with them. Persevere, take the risks. And when you do that, point them to Jesus. Because without the cross, without the resurrection, there is no good news. Evangelism means the gospel, not just good works, not just, you know, making them feel good or feed, feed their stomach, which is we should do, you know, help them, bless them financially or whatever, with food or clothes, whatever the need is. But without the gospel, those actions are not very powerful. So if, you, if you're called to just maybe just uh, feed the hungry, Pray that someone would come behind you to give them the gospel. Or pray God give you the power to share the gospel. But don't just assume. Do not just assume that if you give someone a sandwich, they'll know it's from God and they'll repent. The people need the gospel to be, to be, you know, for them to hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing. Amen. Prepare. That's part of the I don't know what to do part. Prepare. There's so many books about evangelism. If you don't like books, watch right now media. Just uh, you have a free account from to the church. If you don't have it yet, just write me an email. I'll give you another invitation to join right now media and just watch like Netflix, but a thousand, actually 20,000 Christian videos. And of those 20,000, probably a thousand are about, about evangelism. Just watch videos and learn from others. How do they do it? Or talk to those who actually do it and, and be encouraged by them. Be, be around those who share their faith and learn from them, from their example. Team up with them and go with them when, they do it, when they're doing it. Don't just say, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm not prepared. Well, do something about prepare yourself to share the good news because there's so many options. And get others, get others engaged too. It's so much easier to do it with someone. You want to invite a neighbor and you're like, it's kind of like awkward, but you don't know what to do. Well, bring a couple of guys from church and have a barbecue post what you call it lock in order stay at home order not now but you know when done this is done call a couple of guys from the church and have a barbecue and bring a non-christian friend there and then in that environment hope hope and pray and plan for that person to bring the gospel together it's so much easier if you think you're not doing it it's hard for you alone find a partner find a find another person a female or a male whatever and just go and do it with someone else if, you, if, it, if, if alone, it's too hard. And one part I really love. <laughs> Look around for opportunities. And be, in, be on expectation. I love when the, the disciples were in, in a room, in a house, praying for Peter to be released from prison. Peter was in jail, preaching the gospel. And his brothers were, were in a house and were praying for his release. And he is released by God miraculously. God does, does an act of miracle, and Paul is sorry. Peter is free and goes and knocks at the door. And a servant comes and she sees him and she ah, runs away and tells them, "Hey, Peter's at the door." I'm not sure if she did that, but trying to be more, uh, you know, lively. And they didn't believe her. They were praying for Peter to be released. He's at the door, and they don't believe it. I mean, how much faith is there? It's like uh, this. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say this whole village was praying for rain because of the harvest were drying of because of drought. And they were in the middle of the village praying for rain, and just one kid had an umbrella. So tell me who had faith in those moments. So when you pray for things like for God to open doors for you to preach the gospel, be on expectation because God will work, but you must be prepared to expect things to happen. And last and not least. Actually, it's more, but I'm just stopping here because the list is long. Love. Love them enough to find ways to share the gospel with them. If you keep quiet, your unspoken message is this. You don't love them. If you keep quiet, the unspoken message is that you do not love them. And love them even before you get the chance to share the gospel with them. People are not projects. People are souls and worth before God. So don't see them as a, as a checklist. 
So love them even before you get the chance to share the gospel with them. And love them even if they don't respond to the gospel. Don't, you know, share the gospel with them today. And if they say no, turn your back and go and walk away. Don't do that. Persevere. Be there and love them even if they don't respond to the gospel. Just let your love for them be genuine. And they'll see that. And keep investing in relationships. Because that is the most effective tool that you have. The relationships that you have around you with those who do not know Christ, build them up, invest in them, show them love, and love them enough to give them the gospel. In the end, and truly is the end, remember who we are. Paul writes in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, that we are ambassadors for Christ. I want to read these verses for you, for us all. 2 Corinthians verse 5, chapter 5, sorry, verse 18 through 20. Just listen and think about yourself. That's, that's you, Paul writes here about. Not just you, me also, but it's us. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and on. All this is from God, who, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us, all of us, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them, and entrusting to us, so, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled with God. That is our message. We know our mission. I'm praying that we can be bold, and clear and prepared. And we deliver the message, not forcing the results and not losing heart when it gets hard. Not losing heart when it gets hard. Because in the end, God will grow his church. God will bring this ministry up. I pray that we can see around us what disciples would seeing in Acts 16.5. I saw that verse and has become almost like a motto, like a to go verse for me. It's a short, short verse. 16.5. It says this. The churches were strengthened in the faith. And they increased in their numbers daily. That is my prayer for Baldwin Park Church. For my church. My home. That we increase in our faith. Sorry. That we are strengthening our faith. And that we increase in our numbers every day. May God help us all. Let's pray.